One of the most fascinating topics to me in general is the idea of giants. Oversized humans that are said by many cultures to have once roamed the earth and dominated whoever, wherever, and whenever. A lot of times they're associated with the world before the flood, or the antediluvian. Many world mythologies and religions feature stories of epic floods, but the one that is the most detailed, written about, and the most consequential to the modern world is, of course, the biblical flood. For myself, a lot of the more interesting stories about giants also come from the Bible and the associated apocrypha, or non-canon literature, that is on the side. Previously, I did an episode called The Book of Enoch, and another episode called The Book of Giants, each covering exactly what the title says. And those two episodes get probably the most listens and definitely the most comments out of any of the other episodes that I've done. So I thought for this episode, what I would do is take the Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants and sort of mash them together with the Book of Genesis to put them into context together. So we'll get right to it. But I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 5. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. After he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived a total of 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more, because God took him away. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. After he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived a total of 969 years, and then he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah and said, He will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. After Noah was born, Lamech lived 595 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived a total of 777 years, and then he died. After Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now on to Genesis chapter 6. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of humans, and they had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. So Enoch is the seventh generation from Adam, and Enoch's grandson is Noah. It also tells us that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and although the origin of the word is disputed, it's widely believed that they were the byproduct of the sons of God, or the fallen angels, making wives out of the daughters of men. It also tells us that man had basically become evil during this time period. But how and why? Genesis doesn't really give us a concrete answer, but the two books from the Apocrypha, the Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants, can give us hints. So we'll jump into those. From First Enoch It happened after the sons of men had multiplied in those days, that daughters were born to them, elegant and beautiful. And when the angels, the sons of heaven, beheld them, they became enamored of them, saying to each other, Come, let us select for ourselves wives from the progeny of men, and let us beget children. Then their leader, Samyaza, 
said to them, I fear that you may perhaps be indisposed to the performance of this enterprise, and that I alone shall suffer for so grievous a crime. But they all answered him and said, We all swear and bind ourselves by mutual execrations, that we will not change our intention, but execute our projected undertaking. Then they swore all together, and all bound themselves by mutual execrations. An execration is basically a curse, by the way. So now we'll get back to it. Their whole number was two hundred who descended upon Ardis, which is the top of Mount Arman. That mountain, therefore, is called Arman, because they had sworn upon it, and bound themselves by mutual execrations. These are the names of their chiefs, Samyaza, who was their leader, Arakabaramil, Akabil, Tamiel, Ramuel, Danel, Azkil, Saraknyal, Asael, Armors, Batral, Anane, Zavabi, Samsavil, Eteel, Turel, Yamyael, and Arazial. These were the prefects of the two hundred angels, and the remainder were all with them. Then they each took wives, each choosing for himself, whom they began to approach and with whom they cohabited, teaching them sorcery, incantations, and the dividing of the roots of trees, and the women conceiving brought forth giants, whose stature was each three hundred cubits. These devoured all of the labor that men produced, until it became impossible to feed them. When they turned themselves against men in order to devour them, and began to injure birds, beasts, reptiles, and fishes, to eat their flesh one after another, and to drink their blood. Moreover, Azaziel taught men to make swords, knives, shields, breastplates, the fabrication of mirrors, and the workmanship of bracelets and ornaments, the use of paint, the beautifying of the eyebrows, and the use of stones of every valuable and select kind, and all sorts of dyes, so that the world became altered. Impiety increased, fornication multiplied, and they transgressed and corrupted all of their ways. A Maserak taught all the sorcerers the dividers of roots. Armors taught the solution of sorcery. Barkayal taught the observers of the stars. Akabil taught signs. Tamiel taught astronomy. And Asaradel taught the motion of the moon. And men, being destroyed, cried out, and their voice reached the heavens. So if we believe first Enoch, those sons of God came to earth, and mated with humans, and their offspring were giants, who were really not nice to people. They ate all of the food, up to and including humans. The angels also corrupted humans, from innocent dwellers of the once Garden of Eden, to something that wasn't recognizable, from physically altering their appearance, to using sorcery and magic and all sorts of forbidden things. And of course, the making of swords and armor, which implies war. So the entire earth and the people on it had basically changed from what they originally intended to be. So what does the Book of Giants have to add? Let's go there next. The sons of God consumed everything that the earth produced. The fish, the birds in the sky, all the fruit and grain of the earth. They even committed sins against the beasts and the reptiles. They performed every harsh deed with harsh utterance upon male and female creation and upon and among humanity itself. Two hundred angels had been persuaded to leave heaven for the earth. The two hundred angels seized two hundred donkeys, two hundred asses, two hundred sheep and rams of the flock, two hundred goats, two hundred beasts of the field from every animal and from every bird for experiments in inbreeding with humans. The fallen ones defiled all of creation and begot giants and monstrous creatures. They corrupted all the earth, defiling it by bloodshedding at the hands of the giants. But this did not satisfy them, and they sought to devour and destroy much more. They were abominations who lacked true knowledge, and as the earth grew more corrupt and the giants more powerful, they considered persuading more angels to come to earth, otherwise their rule might perish and die. They caused great corruption on the earth and believed that perpetuating it was the only way to avoid destruction themselves. So the Book of Giants basically mirrors the Book of Enoch in this sense. But it does add that those sons of God 
did kind of experiments in inbreeding with humans and presumably produced the monstrous creatures that it mentions afterwards. It also mentions that they must be on some level aware that their time on Earth might be limited or that they were up to no good and didn't want to get caught because it says that they consider trying to get more angels to come to Earth, obviously thinking that there must be some security in numbers. That also mirrors the Book of Enoch where Samyaza gets all the angels that came with him to make a mutual curse upon themselves so that if one of them goes down, they all go down. So now I'm going to jump back to Genesis 6 and read a few more verses. Verse 6. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move on the ground. For I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So, needless to say, God didn't like or approve of anything that was going on. So, he was going to start over, and start over with Noah, the grandson of Enoch. But Enoch and giants have a few things that they add before that point. So we'll go back to Enoch real quick. Then Michael and Gabriel, Raphael, Suriel, and Uriel looked down from heaven. These are archangels, by the way. And saw the quantity of blood which was shed on earth and all the iniquity which was done upon it, and said to one another, It is the voice of their cries, the earth, deprived of her children, has cried even to the gate of heaven. Now, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to reread this entire section of Enoch, but basically what you have is the angels in heaven acknowledging that what's going on in the earth isn't right, and they begin wondering to themselves, why isn't God intervening? And so these archangels basically go and they make an appeal to God. They tell him that the angels have taught the humans sorcery, that they've lain with men and created the giants, and that the entire world is filled with blood and iniquity, and that the good humans are crying out. God responds by sending an angel to the son of Lamech. That's Noah, by the way, saying, Say to him in my name, conceal thyself. Then explain to him the consummation which is about to take place. Well, that would be the flood, of course. For all the earth shall perish, the waters of a deluge shall cover the whole earth, and all things which are in it shall be destroyed. And now teach him how he may escape, and how his seed may remain in all the earth. So God tells this angel to go to Noah, and warn him about the flood, and teach him how to make the ark, and how he can save his family and some of the animals. He also tells Raphael, to go and get Azaziel, and similar things to all the other angels, to go and get them and tell them what's going to happen or even capture them and lock them up in a prison until Judgment Day, essentially. It's at this point that I would jump back to the Book of Giants, which I'm not going to read the whole thing, there's a whole other episode on that, but essentially what you have is the giants, along with some of the fallen angels, like Shemyaza. They begin having dreams and visions that are very ominous and making them very wary. Basically that the end of their world is coming, and it's coming soon. And so they all meet together, and they can't quite figure out what to do. But ultimately they decide to approach Enoch. Enoch, of course, the seventh from Adam, and the grandfather of Noah, who was righteous and walked with God, and according to Genesis, seems like he never died, he was just taken into heaven. So they go, and they give these visions to Enoch, hoping that he can give them an interpretation. Enoch ultimately responds by giving them a tablet, which is to make its way back to Shemyaza, the leader of the angels. It says, basically, Let it be known to the giants and monsters that you will not escape from all the things that you have done. Your wives, their sons, and the wives of their sons will not escape either. And that by your licentiousness on the earth, judgment is upon you. The land is crying out to heaven about you and the deeds of your children and the harm you have done to it. Until Raphael arrives, behold, destruction is coming, a great flood which will destroy all living things. Water is in the deserts and the seas. The meaning of the matters you tell to me, judgment is upon you for all of your evil. But if you now loosen the bonds of evil, repent and pray for forgiveness, you may be saved. So in this build up to the flood, the fallen angels and the giants are made aware of the impending disaster. They have signs and visions which they're not quite sure what to make of, so they go to Enoch, and Enoch tells them 
what's up, basically, as the archangels began to get busy following out the orders that God had given them. Curiously, even the giants and monsters are offered a chance to repent, but apparently don't choose it. Now, in the book of Giants, that's because the giants don't actually think that it's their fault that any of the bad stuff is happening. They just blame the fallen angels, and one can only assume that it's vice versa. And this puts us back at the next part of Genesis, Noah and the Flood. Starting with verse 9. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all the people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark, and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth, will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you, two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and every kind of creature that moves along the ground, will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten, and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything, just as God had commanded him. Then the Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and one pair of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now I will send rain on the earth for forty days and forty nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was six hundred years old, when the floodwaters came to the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and of all the creatures that move along the ground, male and female, came to Noah and entered the ark, as God had commanded Noah. And after the seven days the floodwaters came on the earth. In the six hundredth year of Noah's life, on the seventeenth day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the flood gates of the heavens were opened, and rain fell on the earth for forty days and forty nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kinds, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings, Pairs of all creatures that have breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. For forty days the flood kept coming on the earth, and as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than fifteen cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perish, birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swam over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. People and animals and the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for a hundred and fifty days. But the Bible does tell us that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and thereafter. So what about the thereafter? 
Well, in the book of Numbers, which comes after the exodus from Egypt, we get mention of a character named Anak, or Anak. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. So he's allegedly a descendant of the Nephilim, a line of the giants. And his sons are what these people claim to see, men of great stature. Makes them feel like grasshoppers when these spies see them in the city that they're supposed to conquer. And a little later on, there's the story of David and Goliath. Goliath presumably being the last of the line of the Nephilim, along with his brothers, who ultimately are all slain by David and the Israelites. So there you have it. If you take the Book of Enoch and the Book of Giants and sort of mesh them with the narrative of Genesis, this may be what was going on in the world at the time before the Flood. The next most popular mentions of the Nephilim and these sons of God from the pre-Flood world doesn't really occur until Judgment Day. And that's because the Book of Enoch tells us that they are imprisoned until Judgment Day when they will be released for judgment. The Book of Revelation also tells us that there will be a time when some of these things are released from a pit. But for more on that side of things, I'm going to refer you to loreandlegends.net, which you can get to by clicking the link in the episode description. There will be a couple videos I have posted there that directly tackle this idea of the return of the Nephilim. Sorry this episode took me so long to get out, but I haven't gone anywhere, and there's more coming. See you next time.